Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for Pacific Historic Parks History Talks. I'm Amy, the Education and Interpretation Program and Volunteer Coordinator for Pacific Historic Parks. We're a nonprofit organization who works in partnership with the National Park Service. Together, we support Pearl Harbor National Memorial in Hawaii, home of the USS Arizona Memorial, War in the Pacific National Historical Park in Guam, American Memorial Park in Saipan, Kalaupapa National Historical Park in Molokai, and Diamond Head State Monument in Hawaii. Our mission is to remember, honor, and understand World War II in the Pacific. Through education and interpretive programs, we strive to perpetuate the memory of historical events and honor the people that were involved. History Talks is an interactive series designed to share the history and stories of Pearl Harbor and World War II in the Pacific. History Talk series was designed for students, educators, the general audience, and organizations from across the world to provide live interaction during these uncertain times. Today, we are honored to have as our guest speaker, Dr. Elizabeth M. Norman, who will share the untold story of American women trapped in Bataan. When you're ready, Dr. Norman. I'm ready. Okay. Um, thank you, Amy. Um, my name is Elizabeth Norman. My friends and family call me Beth. I am a professor of humanities at New York University Steinhardt School. And I, before I start the slides, we'll let you know how I came to this story. Uh, I am a registered nurse, which certainly had an impact on these women talking to me. But my dissertation, I had interviewed uh, 50 Army, Navy, and Air Force <coughs> nurses. Of course, it's, it's not nurses who served in Vietnam. And in doing the readings and listening to them, I became very interested in the idea of nurses in war. <coughs> um, the fact that war is a man's game and these women at this point in the military, they were all, all women. There were very few men in, in, the mil in the nurse corps. And the other point is that the reason you're a nurse is to save lives or to uh, help people to graceful deaths. And when you go to war as a nurse, you're walking into a killing zone. So the two factors that you're a woman in a man's world and you're a nurse in a world of killing intrigued me. So when I finished talking about, uh, writing about the nurses who served in Vietnam, I wanted to do something about World War II. I, I knew that the, uh, there were 60,000 approximately military nurses serving the United States during the war. And I thought surely some of them might have had an unusual experience where I could begin to explore some of these ideas. And I called a, uh, an army general who was a uh, career and she had been in the study and she had suggested that I uh, talk to this group, she called them, or the gang in the Philippines. And when I said, well, who are they? Um, she said, well, they're the largest group of female POWs in the history of our country. And I thought, how fascinating to take a look at the idea of nursing on the battlefield and nursing in prison camps. So this uh, very generous uh, Vietnam veteran, this general, she gave me two names of these nurses. I called them and they welcomed me to talk to them. And then they gave me names of other of their group. And so I did the book, We Band of Angels. And in the end, I spoke to 22 of the former female POWs, many more of their families, husbands, children, and several of the uh, American uh, servicemen who they knew during the battle um, for Bataan. Uh, so I'm just gonna get started. I have lots of slides and uh, I'm going to talk behind the slides. So the name of uh, my book and the study was uh, We Band of Angels. And when you, when you think about um, what was going on in America, who were these women? Well, they were the daughters of uh, immigrants. They were the daughters of farmers. Their dads worked in the factories. And when they graduated from high school, they chose one of the three professions or jobs that women uh, in that era in the 20, early 20th century chose. You could either be a nurse, you could be a teacher, you could be a secretary, and maybe if you were a Catholic, you could be a nun. But these nurses decided that they 
were going into nursing and then they did something that was quite different from other um, women of their generation. They volunteered to join the American military. And uh, that made them different from most women who born, raised, married, and died in the same town during that part in America. Uh, when I asked them why they joined the military, several of them said to me, they looked at their mothers, particularly the women who had uh, mothers on a farm. And they said, we just didn't want to work as hard as our mothers. And they wanted a sense of independence. So what they did is they uh, first, the young nurses volunteered for the American Red Cross, which was almost like a reserve for the uh, uh, army and the Navy uh, military. And in 1940, the, um, sorry, um, in 1940, the American draft took place and they suddenly needed more nurses. Up until that point, the nurse corps were quite small and many of them were filled with career nurses who came in during World War I. But all of a sudden, these young nurses could join the army and they did. And they really wanted to get to the Philippines. Why would they want to get to the Philippines? Because um, the Philippines was like a, an American possession. Serving in Manila was like, uh, it was called the Pearl of the Orient. So one of them wanted to go to the Philippines so bad, she was working in Letterman and she tried to sign up and all the slots were taken, Letterman Hospital in San Francisco. All, then the next month it was filled up and finally the third month that she couldn't get over to the Philippines, she crossed somebody's name out and this woman became a POW. And I said to her, well, how do you feel about that? And she said, well, she said, I wanted some adventure and I got a little more than I bargained for. Um, but this first slide is a group of six nurses, as you can see on their way with the US Army Transport Holbrook in October of 1941. This was less than eight weeks before the war broke out. And if you look at them, you say they sure don't look like they're in the military, well, women, they didn't have travel uniforms. They got to wear whatever they wanted to. So no one believed in the people I talked to that Japan was going to attack the United States. They just never thought that a small island nation would come after a country like ours who had w helped win World War I, had overcome the Great Depression. So these women signed up and sailed off on the Holbrook um, expecting to work a little bit, but to have a really good at time. And uh, I'm just going to try to turn on the pointer here. Okay. Um, uh, the, these nurses, the two on the right in the back, did not become prisoners of war, but the three in the front and the one on the left sail off for the um, Philippines and they didn't return because they became prisoners of war. So they get to Manila and pre-war nursing in Manila was really nice. Uh, anybody who's ever worked as a nurse, these nurses worked basically maybe four hour shifts, longer shifts. They got busy when the fleet was in town. Uh, there were bar fights on the island of Corregidor where some of them worked. People got hurt in the polo matches, but it was a really nice life, they said. You only needed three pieces of clothing to really go to the Philippines. You needed your white nurse's uniform. And this is Helen Cassiani working, obviously working as a nurse. You needed your nurse's uniform. You needed a bathing suit because it was very hot and you wanted to swim when you weren't at work. And after sunset, you needed a long gown. So uh, they just, they enjoyed meeting the Pan Am pilots. They went from depression era uh, life on farms to having uh, people do their laundry, they played tennis, they had ball boys, they all said to me, it was marvelous. It was just a wonderful way to live. And I love this slide, mostly because of the outfits. All five of these women became prisoners of war. This is a little earlier than the uh, Holbrook transport, but um, you could, they're in front of the Army and Navy Club, which was the center of social life in Manila for the uh, nurses and the military officers. But it looks like here they're just, they're getting ready for uh, some sort of luncheon. But the fall of 1941, uh, really there were signs of war, even in Manila. And 
they gave out identification cards. And here's one of them that one of the nurses had. This is uh, Louise Anchex, and she came from Mendota, Illinois. The nurses came from all over America. Um, and as I'll try to mention the states where I know they came from. But I like this slide because it also shows you that not everybody was 23 years old. This is Louise Anchex in 1941. You could see, and here she is in her World War I uniform. So she was a career army officer and uh, she uh, served um, overseas and then the Philippines. What happened in the Philippines? Certainly at Pearl Harbor, you're well aware of December 7th. Well, a few hours after Pearl Harbor was attacked, the Japanese turned on the Philippines. Uh, it was December 8th because they were over the international date line. And there had been uh, some information shared between reporters, uh, a man who was in Hawaii named Tremaine with a, a reporter in Manila. And he said, hey, we're under attack. The reporter in Manila went to the airport, to the headquarters um, and said, we heard the Japanese are attacking Hawaii. And they told him to call his friend back in Hawaii and tell him to go back to sleep. So they just, there was a great delay in reply, uh, responding. And sure enough, a few hours after Hawaii was bombed, uh, the Japanese uh, turned towards the Philippines, a lot closer to them. Um, they bombed a small camp in Northern Luzon where there was a nurse just getting ready for regular OR surgical duty that day. And she said when the planes came in with no warning at all, she said, I really think they came in so low I could see the pilots. But the problem was Clark Airfield, which was outside Manila, was the main air base for the uh, Army Air Corps in the Pacific Far East. And they had been warned, uh, but M General MacArthur did not uh, approve the uh, planes going into the air to uh, protect or to chase any Japanese. Uh, for most of the morning of December 8th, around 11.35, um, he said, okay, we're going to do it. So they, they fueled the planes, they put bombs on many of them, they uh, camouflaged some of them, but some of them, they literally were left on the runway at Clark, wingtip to wingtip, and everybody went to lunch. So at 12.35 on December 8th, they attacked uh, Clark Airfield and they blew up the oil dump. They blew up the barracks. They blew up the airstrip. They blew up everything. Fort Stotzenberg was the main military hospital um, that served the field. And the nurses there were again, just expecting a normal Monday morning workday when all of a sudden the world exploded and with no training, no preparation, nothing, um, they started to have to crawl around on the ground during the uh, uh, bombing so they wouldn't be hurt. They learned there were so many casualties coming in that they uh, did very informal triage. They tried to give pain medication to the men and they would take methylate or red lipstick and they'd put a red M on their um, uh, forehead so people knew that this man had already gotten his morphine. Uh, they talked about that day to me, the nurses up in Clark Field, and they basically said, we got to work, we didn't think what was going on, but even the nurses who had been in World War I and had a lot of experience said a phrase I've heard many times before from nurses in combat, and they said to me, nothing can prepare you for the sights and the sounds and the physical consequences of war, but they went to work. But by afternoon of December 8th, again, December 7th in Hawaii, um, our Pacific Air Corps was destroyed. And this slide really illustrates it. Now the Navy in Cavite Naval Yard, which was right near Manila, they also were attacked. They had moved some of the sub subs and ships off of Cavite prior to December 8th, but you can just take a look at the base and see what happened to it. Again, there were Navy nurses working there in the Naval Hospital that day, and they talked about patients, and these were civilian and military uh, bombing victims showing up at the hospital on the roofs of cars, on old doors, anything, anybody could uh, put somebody on to get them to the hospital. And what the nurses would do would be tag patients, immediate surgery, major surgery, or minor surgery. And this went on for hours and hours while the bombing was going on and one of the nurses, Peg Nash, uh, 
who came from Pennsylvania said to me, I was working in the OR and I thought, she said, if the Japanese come over once again and drop another bomb, this suffering will be over, mine too. But of course it wasn't over. And by the end of the first day of the war, the Japanese controlled the sea, they controlled the air. Um, and uh, the Americans were getting pushed back off their destroyed bases. And they went to the city of Manila, the capital city, where they were for a few weeks in December. But they knew that they couldn't stay in the city. They were causing too many civilian casualties. So General MacArthur instituted a War Plan Orange, uh, a strategy that had been developed in the 1930s. And it called for the American military to leave the city of Manila and to retreat to the jungle peninsula of Bataan. Um, and that's what they planned to do. So in the middle of the of Japanese offensive, the uh, um, military has to leave the city, including all of the nurses who were there. And they did manage to get to the peninsula of Bataan, but the Navy nurses who had left this Cavite Naval Yard Hospital, they also went to Manila and they did not retreat to Bataan. The Navy stayed in Manila and on January 1st, 1942, this is the group of Navy nurses who surrendered to the Japanese. There are 11 of them and they're standing in front of Santa Scholastica School, which they turned into a hospital. I really like the slide. If you look on the far right, you'll see a woman who surrendered wearing a dress with a Peter Pan collar and a belt. That's Dottie Still. And the nurses did not have what we call combat fatigues, nothing. So as the war progressed, as the bombings went on, they had to get out of their white uniforms and they found homemade cloth. And the Navy being the Navy, they made uh, blue uniforms, uh, uh, dark and and light blue uniforms, and that's what they surrendered in their homemade uniforms. The army nurses did a similar thing, but of course their homemade uniforms were khaki. When these nurses surrendered, they didn't have any idea what the Japanese were gonna do to them, but they did know one thing. When the Japanese came into this makeshift hospital, they were going to loot. And so the lead nurse, and it takes many things to survive combat in the prison experience, and leadership is absolutely at the top. But if you look at the front row, second to the right, there's a woman in very dark hair. She looks a little older than the other women. That's Laura Cobb. She was the chief of the Navy nurses. And she told the nurses to go into the closet where they'd stored their medicines and to mislabel them. They wanted to keep quinine because malaria was pandemic in the Philippines, epidemic, it was everywhere. And they wanted to hold on to it. So they took adhesive tape and they labeled uh, quinine sodium of bicarbonate. And then they went to the baking soda, sodium of bicarbonate and labeled it quinine. When the Japanese came in, they walked off with what they thought was a very valuable medicine and they had nothing. And you saw this periodically that there was something about the flexibility and how these women could adapt to circumstances where nobody had ever, um, mentioned, you know, do this or do that, um, just did remarkably. So the Navy nurses surrender and go into prison camp in January of 42. The army nurses uh, retreat to the Peninsula of Bataan, as I said. Now, if you look at the slide over to the right, over Manila Bay would be the city. And then over to the left would have been Subic Bay in the South China Sea. Bataan was a heavily forested peninsula. You could see there's a main road going down the right side, and then you see a road going across the peninsula. Well, that road going across the peninsula was really a water buffalo caribou trail. It was incredibly rural, and onto this peninsula came approximately 100,000 people. Lots of civilians, 76 uh, thousand American troops that included the army nurses. And what they tried to do on the, during Bataan in December and January is set up hospitals to treat the casualties from the fighting that was going on and sure to get worse. They did set up one hospital along the main road there. You can see it on the right in, uh, uh, and they had to move it because it was getting bombed. So they moved it a little further south but that was called hospital number one. 
and I'll show you a photo of that in a minute. The other hospital that they did was deep in the jungle, not too far from the Maravelis Mountains, if you look towards the bottom part of the slide. And there they set up one of the most remarkable hospitals, certainly in 20th century American military history. This was an OR on Bataan. They took what medical supplies they could and the fighting was so severe Remember, by now, uh, the Americans are pushed onto this peninsula and the Japanese are controlling everything. And on December 22nd, they landed Imperial troops and the Imperial troops were at the top of the peninsula of Bataan. And the idea was, unless we surrendered, they were gonna push everyone down to the uh, tip of Bataan. Uh, I was, do wanna point out the American troops the majority of them, there were Filipinos in the Philippine scouts and that supported the American army. So there were tens of thousands of Filipino soldiers also on the peninsula of Bataan. But what you're looking at here is Lucy Wilson, the nurse. She was from Big Sandy, Texas. And she said during one 12 hour period, they did 187 main procedures. They used hot water bottles, they used blankets, when the uh, bombing would come over, the surgical team would squat down below the uh, patient, but keep their hands up above the patient so they stayed sterile. And when the bombing was over, they could continue their um, uh, surgery. Uh, chaplains would walk around uh, giving last rites. Uh, they talked about patients with chest wounds. Uh, they can often make a sucking sound. It's called the sucking chest wound and they talked about those sounds in the OR, the sterilizers hiss, but they worked and they worked. And in a way that helped them enormously, because if there's one thing that nurses, particularly those in wartime, is to really be respected and needed. Now, prior to the bombing on December 8th, army and nurses, Navy nurses, they might've been called second lieutenant or first lieutenant, but they had something called relative rank which means they held the rank, but they got paid less than the men. And certainly nurses were always needed in the military, but they were very much on the periphery. Once the bombs started, they became central. And that was a great motivating factor for these nurses to keep doing these 187,000 surgeries. 187, please, in one day. This is hospital number two called the Jungle Hospital. And I don't think the American military's had a hospital like this since the Civil War. The hospital number one along that road couldn't accommodate all the casualties. So they went inland and they found a flat area where they could bulldoze it, get the Filipino civilians to bulldoze it. And they also got the farmers to make uh, beds and to find mattresses and stuff them with hay. And they literally set up wards under the jungle. They told them not to cut the canopy to try to keep the, everything ahead so the spotter planes wouldn't see the hospital. But this is what a ward looked like. And the nurses worked in these wards every day. Here's another picture of a ward. You can see when they ran out of uh, beds, they just put the mattresses on the ground. And these men were waiting for surgery. They had more minor injuries. One of the issues that the hospitals had is not only were they dealing with the injuries of war, the trauma injuries, but MacArthur and the leadership, when they planned this retreat to uh, Bataan, they, they didn't have enough food. So as soon as they got on the peninsula, people were hungry. They didn't bring enough medicines. So everybody was getting sick with dengue fever, uh, malaria, uh, dysentery. So what you had here is not only men who needed surgical care for their war wounds, but who were very sick themselves. And on top of that, the nurses were not eating anything. They, they, they were eating very minimal things too. So they were also getting dysentery and losing weight. But again, they felt needed. They felt this is free decor. And uh, that again, this hospital number two, I had a very hard time trying to get this into my head when I spoke with these nurses. And one of them said to me, you know what? Did you ever see that movie, Gone with the Wind? Of course. She said, if you think about the scene in the Atlanta train station where the camera starts on one casualty and then eventually pulls back until the entire screen is filled with casualties, 
They said, that's what number two looked like. You'd walk into the jungle and it would be dark. And then as soon as your eyes would get accustomed to, to the darkness, as far as the eye could see were different wards in hospital number two. And as December moved into January, January moved into February, the, the Japanese are pushing down, the casualties are getting worse, the medical illnesses are getting worse, and hospital number two kept expanding and expanding. I believe towards the end, they had about 6,000 patients in this hospital that, and all of them surrendered to the Japanese. But the nurses just kept working. This was the very glamorous nurses quarters. They went from living in a very nice uh, uh, peacetime military uh, quarters to literally in the jungle. They talked about monkeys swinging in the trees, but that stopped because as the fighting went on and the hunger continued, the monkeys disappeared because they were eating them. They learned to find the metal coffee cans that got discarded and fill them with water um, and put them under the legs of the bed so the ants wouldn't crawl up and bite them. But again, their morale stayed high. And as one of them said, well, we didn't have much choice. There was nowhere to go, but they were believing in these rumors. And there were rumors and MacArthur said, told them just an outright lie during the fighting when he said, help is on its way. Well, there was never help coming to the Philippines. The fleet was sitting on the bottom of Pearl Harbor and our Air Corps was destroyed at Clark Field. So it did keep morale going. And I said to one of the women at one point, come on, didn't you really question some of these rumors? And she said, you know, it's ludicrous now to talk about these rumors, but those rumors really kept us going. We held on to them and they kept us going for many weeks. The nurses went from working very nice shifts pre-war to just working. You worked from sunrise to sunset or from sunset to sunrise. And here's a picture of Jeannie Kennedy. She's from Philadelphia, Mississippi, and she's sitting on her bed um, and she's repairing her overalls. What the army nurses started to wear were Army Air Corps coveralls. And, and they were much better than the dresses that they had been wearing. However, when you got on Bataan, if you got a hole in your shoe, if you got a hole in your uh, coveralls, you fixed it. You know, there was nothing else coming. So there she is sitting on her bed. And what the nurses would do on Bataan, and that's Jeannie sitting on the rock looking directly at the camera, is when they would get time off, they put screens in front of the uh, river that, that went by them. It was really a creek. And they'd just sit there in the coolness and they'd talk and they'd just try to decompress from the tragedies that they were seeing in their hospitals. One of their favorite were to sing songs, to sing songs from their states and from, the, from their uh, popular uh, country songs. And they said even those few minutes just helped us um, get ready uh, for the next shift. The woman on the far left is Rosemary Hogan and I'm gonna mention her in just a minute. So February turns into March. And in March, General MacArthur leaves the Philippines with his family and key army officers and goes to Australia. That was the point <clears throat> that the nurses and all the military realized that this was it. They weren't going anywhere. And it was at that point, the Japanese gave General Wainwright, who was in charge of the forces, um, and, uh, and General King, you know, wanted them to surrender, but the Americans didn't surrender. So there truly was a firestorm on, on Bataan once MacArthur left and the Japanese knew it was only a moment in time. Um, so what they did, I'm gonna get back to that other slide. This is hospital number one, but before the fighting, you could see to the lower right, there's a big red cross and there's a red cross on a shed. Well, the Japanese bombed this hospital two 500 pound bombs went right through the roof of one of these wards and killed patients, blew corpsmen and blew medics up into the air, beds. Two nurses were wounded with shrapnel and one of them was the nurse you just saw in the previous photo, uh, Rosemary Hogan on the far left. Um, but they kept working and both the nurses who were wounded with shrapnel became prisoners of war. Now there's certain things as you know in wartime that really helped. And I already had mentioned Laura Cobb, the Navy nurse. Well, here's the Army nurse. These are the Army nurse leaders. 
And again, one reason these nurses were able to do what they did was their leadership. Now, if you look on the far left, that's Josie Nesbitt. And in my opinion, Josie is the real, she's the real hero and leader of the nurses. She was the assistant to the nurse corps, but she was the kind of leader you hope you get in times of crisis. She worked very hard. She was a, a head nurse um, at uh, number two, and she just worked herself as hard as she demanded of her staff, but she had a great streak of humanity in her. And, and when she saw a nurse wasn't feeling good, she made sure she got some food. If a nurse had a hole in her shoe or ran out of underwear, she did what she could. <laughs> so she was very much a strong leader and a great humanitarian. The Filipino nurses called her Mama Josie. The woman in the middle is Maud Davison. She's the chief army nurse in the Philippines. Maud Davison, like Josie, was a career military nurse. <clears throat> she was born in Canada, but she spent the career in World War I up through this. If you look at, uh, at Maud Davison's face, you can see the kind of leader she was. She really represented a mid 20th century military leader. You did what you were told. You always referred to her at, as, um, you, you called her Miss Davison. You never called her anything else, although behind her back, they call her Ma Davison. And she demanded absolute uh, responsibility and respect from her nurses. You can see, if you can re-see the slide clear enough, they never lost their sense of humor and the uh, sign they're standing in front of says nurses quarters, please ring before entering. Trust me, there was no electricity. And the woman on the right on this slide is uh, one of the younger nurses. That's Anna Williams from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Maud Davison was 57 years old at this picture taken. And Anna Williams was in her early 30s, uh, 20s. So you had the youngest and the oldest there. Well, once the Bataan hospitals were bombed, it was bombed, the Japanese troops were getting so close to these hospitals, <coughs> which held thousands of patients, um, General King knew that he had to surrender. And so he, he they planned to surrender. Um, and uh, on uh, April 10th, that's what happened. And before the surrender, though, he was determined to get the American nurses off Bataan to this fortress of Corregidor, which was an island uh, two miles off the coast of Bataan and into the island prior to the war they dug these, dug these laterals. And one of these laterals was um, a hospital lateral. And you can see a picture here of a nurse in the 1930s sitting in the lateral. Well, as they go to get off Bataan, um, the Japanese were so close, the nurses told me they could hear small arms fire near the hospital. So the chief nurses got their staff together and they said, we've been ordered to leave. And this was the most difficult moment for these nurses in their entire war experience. Imagine yourself, you're in charge. The average nurse had 300 patients under her care. You just had to walk away. You had to walk past those beds in the jungle. You had to walk past those sheds where men had been wounded and leave them. And the whole lives that bothered them, they'd often say to me, you're a nurse, you'll understand this. We were just following orders, which they were. Um, but um, it, it, you know, it, it bothered them to the end. Now, Josie Nesbitt, who ran the jungle hospital, heard the orders and she went to her surgeon, to the commander and said, if my Filipino nurses don't go with us, none of us are going. Now, Josie always respected the military and she so shocked uh, the Duckworth, who was the surgeon in charge of the hospital, that he called Corregidor and he got the orders changed and all the nurses got to leave. And there's no doubt that Josie's insistence that her Filipino nurses leave saved lives because as many of us know, after the surrender on May 10th, uh, the Japanese gathered up the Filipino and Americans, put them on a forced march from the tip of peninsula of uh, Bataan to the end. Um, and it was the first major atrocity of Americans and Filipinos in the war. If the men fell behind, they were murdered. They weren't given food, they weren't given water. And while there's great controversy over the number of men who died on the Bataan Death March, it's, 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 in, the, it's in the hundreds. 
Um, and these nurses were spared that. But once they got over to Corregidor, they were put to work in the hospital tunnel, which looked nothing like this slide you're looking at here. It had triple tier bunks and a thousand patients in it. And so the nurses got to work. Once Bataan fell, everything turned on the island of Corregidor and it became a siege. They bombed 24 hours a day. The casualties were horrific. As April moves into May, General Wainwright was able to get some forces, including some nurses, off of Corregidor, but he surrenders. And here's a group of nurses ready to surrender. And what were they to do? Nobody told them what to do. But Maud Davison gathered them all together and said, you're gonna keep working. You're gonna keep your Red Cross armband on your sleeve in the hopes that the Japanese recognize it and you're gonna keep your head down. And that's what they did. The Japanese entered these tunnels. They couldn't believe there were women in the American military because there were none in the Japanese military. They had 12,000 Marines uh, and soldiers to deal with on Corregidor. So they left the nurses in the tunnel for a while, but they also realized uh, that they had a propaganda coup on their hands. And the night of the surrender, this is one of the most poignant documents I've ever seen. And it's in the Army Medical Museum in Fort San Antonio in Texas. They took a piece of bed sheet and they wrote on it, members of the Army Nurse Corps and civilian women who were in Malinta Tunnel when Corregidor fell. And they all signed it. And I said to them, why did you do this? And they said, look, we had no idea what was gonna happen to us. You know, the rape of Nanking had been like a few years earlier. They thought they were gonna be put on a boat, taken out to the South China Sea and dumped. And they said to me, we needed a record so our parents and family could see where we were at last. And um, you can just take a look at it. You can see Maud Davison is at the top of the second column. Ann Mueller was a chief, uh, very senior nurse and Josie Nesbitt is on the right. So that's what they did. And then the Japanese, when they found these nurses, marched six of the youngest of them out of the tunnel and sat them down for a propaganda photo. And it was the first time the nurses had been out of the tunnel. And uh, the nurse on the far right, you can see she's looking away. They got to look around and they got to see the damage that had been done to Corregidor. And um, the person on the far right, Eleanor Garen from South Bend, Indiana, I got to know her and I asked her what was she doing? And she was so angry that they had surrendered. And anger is a good, a uh, characteristic to have when you surrender because it's certainly a motivator. And she said to me, I'll be damned if I was gonna look at a Japanese photographer and smile. So that's the photo. Now, the one thing they wanted to keep doing was work as nurses. So the Japanese, again, were gonna come into loot and they decided the only thing they needed to keep working was their wristwatches. So they tried to pop the jewels out of them, scratch them a little bit, make them very unappealing and their nursing school pins, which were often gold and jeweled, they kind of left those around and the Japanese took their nursing school pins, but didn't take their watches. So they went to work. But in uh, June of 1942, uh, the Japanese moved the army nurses off of Corregidor into the Santo Tomas internment camp or stick as it's known. This was a Jesuit, very old Jesuit university in the heart of Manila, it had, a, it had a wall around it, and it was a perfect spot for the Japanese to put civilian um, allies, the, the, the pilots, the missionaries, the engineers, um, the old Spanish-American war vets who never came home, and they put thousands of people into, onto this campus, including the military nurses. I can see I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna go through the slides, and um, there's a wonderful story about them uh, these army nurses fooling the Japanese with uh, tape making a shawl that was actually a military flag, a quartermaster flag into a shawl and they kept it. The Japanese never took it. But this is a very interesting slide. This is a mix of the army and Navy nurses. And you can see one of the uh, prison buildings in the back and they're all in their handmade uniforms, the army in their khaki, the nurses in their Navy. And you can see there's a little boy in there. That's um, Albert and they called him Terrible Albert. And I would say, what a name. How could you call a child in a prison camp that? And they said, no, no, 
he was our buddy, but he was a mischief maker and he kept breaking bones and doing things and he used up more resources than anybody else. But the nurses did set up with the intern um, civilian physicians, um, a hospital and a convent right there. And Santa Catalina Hospital was right across the street. And it was into this hospital that they started to take care of patients. Most primitive, you can see the bedside stands are really crates, but the civilian doctors brought in equipment when they were sent in there and they just went to work. Uh, they set up uh, schedules for the nurses. There weren't many medicines, but they used diet therapy. They used lamp therapy. Uh, when they needed sutures, they took hemp and they uh, sterilized it and were able to use sutures. It really was quite a remarkable, um, uh, just how they adapted healthcare to it. Um, they, uh, they also tapped some rubber trees and made adhesive. So their bandages, which were really cloth stuck, but this was very good, this hospital, because it gave the nurses a reason to get up every day. It kept the group together. And Maud Davison was such a tough nut that many of the nurses said when they were tired or sick, the mere thought of going to Maud Davison and saying, I can't work today. Oh, that was way worse. They went to work. But she, that was incredibly important. They kept thinking they were going to be released. 1942 turns into 1943. They'd say, oh, they'll be here by Christmas. They'll be here by Easter. They'll be here by my birthday. And it didn't happen. As the, in 1943, all of these women, and there were a total of 77 at this point. There were 11 Navy nurses, 66 Army nurses. They had been miss missing in action along with the American men. They got to send postcards home. And here's an example of a post, two postcards that these women sent home. They were censored by the Japanese. They couldn't have dates on them. So they used Christian holy days, like as of all saints day, I'm fine. And their parents knew that was November 1st and the Japanese didn't have a clue. But 1943 turned into 44. And here's a slide of the camp, the prisoners online to get meat, online to get vegetables, anything. Starvation was starting to be a problem. The diets were awful. As the Japanese began to lose the Pacific campaign, things got much worse in the camps. And as bad as it was in these camps, it was horrific in the military camps. One of the main things the nurses are grateful for is they were not sent with the men. Although they wanted to treat and care for them, they, um, there was a 40% mortality rate in those camps. So nine, here's an example, and you don't have to be a nutritionist to see what the diets were like. People started to die from starvation. They started to get all the diseases of starvation, like beriberi. Every nurse I talked to had beriberi, a very painful disease, uh, a vitamin B deficiency. The chief nurse, Maud Davison, was 60 years old. She developed an intestinal obstruction, which happens when your diet is not there. And she was actually in the hospital. So they started to make a joke. Who's going to get us first, the Marines or the Crows? And one night in 1945 now, remember, they went in in 1942, they were sitting at their bedroom windows and they were on curfew. The Japanese were doing maneuvers on the campus and the gate that, uh, uh, for the campus all of a sudden came crashing down and they did, thought it was the Japanese, but they uh, looked and they pulled right up to that building where the nurses were and the tanks, they, op they, the, the, they popped the hatch and they looked up where the nurses were in their second floor room and they just said something. They knew they were saved. They said, hello folks. Everybody went crazy. They surrounded these tanks. And here's a slide from the next day. Up on the, uh, that ledge behind the American flag are the nurses. No one had seen the American flag since they surrendered. And when they saw it on the uh, turrets of the tanks, somebody in this group started to sing, God bless America. And by the time it was over, land that I love, stand beside it and guide it. Everybody was singing and crying, including the combat soldiers who had rescued them. And uh, people have said it was one of the most moving moments in the war, but the Americans and Filipinos had spearheaded into this camp because they were afraid there was gonna be a massacre. They were surrounded by the Japanese who immediately started to lob artillery and there was terrible fighting um, that night. 
And here's an example. This was Cassie, the nurse in her white uniform. Uh, they went to work. Uh, they were so thin, and but this is what military nurses do. Here she's taking care of a wounded uh, American during the battle, and before he goes into the OR, she's just making notes that will help them. One nurse told me that this was the night they knew that they were um, had been away so long. One nurse was asked to get penicillin. She didn't know what it was. Um, uh, one nurse said she reached down to touch a cheek of a soldier and she said, you have no idea how good you look to me. And he reached up and touched her cheek and said, how'd you like to go home, kid? And she said it was the first time she cried in three years. They didn't know what C rations were, but they got to notify their parents that they were alive. And one of the first groups to get out of Santa Tomas, the first group after the Japanese had, uh, uh, you know, the battle was over were these nurses. Now, if you look to the far right, there's a woman sitting down with a khaki hat on. That's Maud Davison. And she was 60 years old. And uh, she was not going to leave the camp. Uh, she's not going to let her girls leave the camp without her. So she got onto the truck and off they went. Uh, these are the Navy nurses. They actually ended up in a different camp. And they're, they're, they're all flown to Southern Leyte Island. I like this slide because you can see over to the right a nurse sitting in a chair. And that's Dottie Still. She was the woman who surrendered with a Peter Pan collar and just a, you know, just a simple dress. And she said to me that I just didn't have the energy to stand. Here's another slide. And if you look over to the right, the second woman from the right with the big smile on her face, that's Peg Nash. Um, and Peg Nash, I said to her, uh, what was that? What, what's that stripe across your uniform? Uh, Peg came from Wilkesboro, Pennsylvania. And she said, Beth, I was an OR nurse. I wore that every day in camp and I actually wore the material out rubbing it against the OR table. But the nurses were awarded bronze stars and a promotion in rank. But this is what they look like. This is Minna Anson from Minot, North Dakota. And that's a pre-war before she went over and when she came home. Now, Helen, um, I got to know very well. And this is a slide you can see um, much later when I was doing the book. Uh, she went to a nurse's uh, conference with me near her and they gave her an award. And I like the slide because she's really giving me a hard time. She's not moving her lips, but she's saying, why are you doing this? I hate that you're doing this. They did not like the spotlight put on them. They felt they were just doing their jobs, that the true heroes of this were the men who never came home. Um, I do want to tell you a quick story and I'll wrap it up soon. But Maud Davison was put up for the Distinguished Service Medal. Here's the thing to remember about the group. 77 women went into captivity in 1942 with no survival training. They didn't even do calisthenics. 77 women walked out of those prison camps in 1945. It's a, it's a statistic unmatched in the Pacific War. Every one of them lived, in part because of luck, anger, they were nurses, they were needed, and their leadership. Well, Maud Davison was put up for the Distinguished Service Medal by the men who'd served with her on Bataan, on Corregidor, and knew of her work in camp. And it went all the way through the Decorations Board to get a Distinguished Service Medal and she was denied at the end. And I'm just gonna read you a very short sentence. And it says, the position of chief nurse of a field command is not considered a position of great responsibility in the distinguished service medal sense. The position is normally lacking in duty, requiring the exercise of independent initiative and responsibility. The Legion of Merit therefore is the appropriate medal. How about that? So, Joe, uh, so Maud Davison gets the uh, Legion of Merit. And then when my book, We Band of Angels, uh, came out, some of the uh, Senator Inouye from Hawaii and several of the active military nurses were so upset. They did a campaign and <clears throat> about 40 years after Maud Davison did her service, she had died in the 1950s, but she got the Distinguished Service Medal. And I can't tell you what that meant for the 12 or so surviving nurses that they finally acknowledged that a nurse and a woman could uh, achieve a, a medal of that rank. So over the years, they were in their 80s and 90s when I met them, they died. And uh, the last one alive was Millie Dalton Manning. And Millie uh, 
came from Georgia. I got to know her well. She didn't live far from me. I live in Montclair, New Jersey. Um, and Millie lived in uh, West Trenton. And I would visit her often. And we'd talk a lot about that she was it. Once she was gone, this remarkable group of women was gone. And obviously, here's a picture of her in, uh, after the war in 1945 and a picture of her when I saw her. Uh, well, Millie died in 2013. And uh, this was her funeral. And it was held at a military uh, cemetery, obviously. And I went to it. And if you look at the slide on your left, that is Major General Jimmy Keaton, who was in uh, charge of the Army Nurse Corps, came up from Washington and gave a flag to her son. The slide to the right, uh, the Army Nurse Corps, many officers came to Millie's funeral. And all of those four active duty Army Nurse Corps officers had served in Iraq and Afghanistan. The person in the front the, uh, is General Wilma Vaught, an Air Force general, uh, not a nurse. But General Vaught signed up for um, and started the Women in Military Service Academy Corporation. And WIMSA, it, her museum and that she set up supports all women from the revolution to today and what they've contributed to our military. Um, quite a remarkable woman. And then the slide in the middle, I'm going to end with this. That's the youngest of the nurses who came to Millie Dalton's funeral. And my final words for my presentation were Millie's words, because I'd say, Millie, what do you want your legacy to be? And Millie um, said this to me, and these are the last words of the book um, that uh, I wrote about them. She said, we spent our lives helping people and we did it with honor and love and we never looked back. So I'd like to thank you very much as you can guess, I could probably talk for another two hours on stories, but I'm more than happy to answer your questions. Uh, excellent presentation. Uh, so the first question that I have for you is actually from Jason. His question was, um, was it difficult to get these nurses to tell their stories as how some veterans of war kind of are very shy, uh, they don't want to tell their story? Yeah, thanks, Jason. That really is a good story. These women never talked about their story, ever. But I thought about what happened. I think two things happened. They were in their 70s, 80s, and 90s when I approached them. And I started this project in 1990. And they knew that if they didn't share their story with somebody, it was going to die with them. And then I come along. And here's this registered nurse doing this research. And I think they thought, that I might, I might be the right person to tell the story to. And they didn't trust people a lot, but you know, word got around. They had quite a network, you know. Yeah, it's okay to talk to this person. You should tell her things. So they snowballed themselves, but I think their age and the fact that I was a nurse was the reason they talked to me. All right, thank you. Uh, so I'm gonna have Nancy. Nancy's going, I'm gonna have, have you unmute yourself. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Norman. Um, I'm an NYU, now Steinhardt, when I graduated with education in physical oh. therapy, grad. Uh -huh. um, and I know that Mary McMillan, one of the founders of the Physical Therapy Association, uh, was a civilian at Santo Tomas. She got trapped there coming back from China. She's a physical therapist. Um, did the nurses speak at all about other, uh, other non-military medical professionals who may have been helping with them oh, in absolutely. the camps? Absolutely. First of all, when I graduated, it was CNAP, just to give you an idea how long oh, ago. Oh, you graduated from my sister, who was a nurse graduate at <laughs> CNAP. Anyway, <laughs> I, I actually teach physical therapy students now. No, the point I want to make out, they absolutely embraced. And, and in my book, I, I mentioned there actually was a physical therapist. Her name was Westblot, Vivian Westblot. And she was with the nurses through, um, through the battles, and she was in camp with them. And they just considered that physical therapist, she was just part of them. Um, yes. So they, they had so much work to do in the prison camps, the healthcare, that, uh, you know, any civilian nurse, and the same thing on Bataan and Corregidor, any, any nurse and nest, any, anybody who could help and was a professional, they were welcomed with open arms. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much. The next person that I have is Marie, Marie, I'm going to ask you to unmute and go ahead and unmute yourself. Uh, there we go. Uh, thank you. 
thank you very much for your presentation. I was wondering, the, did some of these women continue to serve in the military after World War II? Or did some of them want to stop because they obviously had very hard life during the camps? It's a very mixed bag. Most of them left. And it, very interesting, Laura, a lot of them who wanted to stay couldn't. Their physical health was so poor that they didn't even have the energy anymore to work an eight-hour shift. So yes, a few of them stayed in the military and had very successful careers, including a person called Ruby Bradley. I didn't talk about her because of the time. Ruby was the chief nurse in the Korean War. And she was one of the first nurses to have an international military parade of review, one of the first women to achieve the permanent rank of colonel in the army. And when she retired, she was, and she still may be, the most decorated woman in our country. But uh, Ruby was humble. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. So I hope that answers your question. Uh, next person I have is Fritz. Fritz, I'm gonna ask you to unmute yourself. Yes, thank you. Um, I, I knew uh, Madeline Olam for uh, many years and um, she, <laughs> she used to um, say that her diabetes in later years was caused by the starvation in the camps. Did, did that happen to many of the nurses, uh, the, um, you know, the, the effects of the starvation? I didn't hear about diabetes. By the way, Madeline Mullen was some character. She was. <laughs> we went to a cocktail party once and she had on a lovely cocktail dress and orange tennis sneakers. Um, no, the disease thing, again, I didn't talk about it. One of the things that happened to these women is that they were used for war bond drives to raise money and they were happy to do it, but nobody ever studied them. They did some studies of the POWs in the 50s, not a lot, but here was right. 77 women. We never studied them. So I can't tell you what the impact of uh, being a prisoner of war was on their fertility, on their cancer rates, on their heart disease rates. I mean, on, on diseases we know prisoners of war tend to have a higher incidence of than civilian populations. So um, I didn't hear of diabetes, but let me say, every one of them had dental problems, terrible yeah. lung problems. Several of them died of teeth from TB. Um, and, but, but, but the particular, you know, the gynecologic and obstetric things we could have learned, we didn't. We lost, we lost the opportunity. So whether Madeline's diabetes was related to the camps, maybe, but I don't know about that. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, we have a little bit more time for a few more questions. I have Mildred. Mildred, I'm gonna ask you to unmute. Oh, I think I might have muted you by accident. Try one more time again, Mildred. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Hi, Dr. Norman. I was just wondering, you have this incredible amount of information from these nurses, and I just love hearing about it. How, how many times did you speak to each one of them, and how, how did you know when you could stop. I mean, I'm sure it sounds so very interesting. I'm sure you always wanted to hear from them, but did you have a set number of times that you spoke to each one of the nurses or? No, I actually didn't. And, and I know the point you're getting at. Often when you interview people or you do a study, you reach a point where you say, okay, I got it all. But this was a very different group. And I interviewed them as often as I could because uh, I knew that they were going to be gone soon. And the more I talked to them, the more layers of the story became undone. So I, I honestly can't answer your question. I don't know how many times I talked to them. Um, but I do know that, um, I mean, people like uh, Millie Dalton and Cassie, I mean, I saw them until they died. So um, the formal interviews always kept going, but there were lots of informal conversations too. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, I just want to say that I did put copies of those interviews and all my material um, at the uh, MacArthur Museum in Virginia, uh, in Norfolk, Virginia, because they have a very, regardless of my feelings about MacArthur, they have a very fine archive there. So everything's down there. Wonderful. Thank you.
Uh, I have one question from Sean. Sean's question is, what was the reaction from the Nurses Corps after hearing General MacArthur had left the Philippines? Uh, they got, they got, they got down. Everybody got down because these, these rumors and things that they were keeping them going, they knew, or as one of them put from that old expression, the handwriting was on the wall. And you know, they, they just, um, they, th that, and, and not only when MacArthur left, there was a real feeling about, you know, why had he told them help was on the way? And then as soon as he left, I mean, the fighting, you know, there was a whole new offensive that went on. It never stopped, but it got much worse at that point. Okay. Uh, this seems to have one last question for you. It is from Karen. Karen, I'm going to ask you to unmute right now. Oh, first of all, thank you so much for the amazing stories and for putting that out. Um, I just can't even tell you how exciting it is to hear about all of this. Thank you. Um, my question is, how, as you started to gather stories, were you really highly motivated to publish these quickly? No. No, okay. No, I was not in any hurry. Um, I knew that I needed to take my time and I knew I was going to get one shot. And that if I didn't do it right and didn't do it thoroughly and didn't, you know, read the histories and spend time with them, I'd never have another chance. So, no, I, I really took my time. Um, yeah. I mean, frankly, it took me eight years to do this story from the start to the first publication of We Band of Angels. Wow. Thank you. But it was so interesting, I have to tell you. No doubt. All right, so uh, that was the last of the questions, but uh, just a couple comments from our guests. I had a couple comments saying like uh, some that have read your book already and said they really enjoyed it, and some during the during this presentation had even commented that they had bought your book and they're awaiting it with excitement to read your book. Thank you. And I will hand this over to Nanette now. Thank you. It's okay. it's an honor. It's an honor to tell this story to people at Pearl Harbor. And I just, you know, I know you shouldn't speak for other people, but I can tell you that these nurses would be so pleased that there was an opportunity for people to hear their story at Pearl Harbor. Yes, that's great. Okay. So on behalf of Pacific Historic Parks and Edutainment Learning, we would like to thank you for joining us today. I am Nanette Kyota, the Education and Interpretation Coordinator with Pacific Historic Parks. Dr. Norman, it's been an honor to have you share your experience with us, and we appreciate your willingness to share. Anytime. History Talks series is an education and interpretive program designed to educate participants about the history of Pearl Harbor and World War II in the Pacific. Your kind donation is an opportunity for us to continue to provide free interactive programs to our viewers. In the chat box, we have a link that will connect you to a short survey. This will allow you the opportunity to share your feedback, suggestions, any questions that you may have for Dr. Norman and provide a donation to support our History Talk series. Thank you, everyone. I'll turn it over back to Nick. All right, thank you, everyone. So I'm going to un allow everyone to unmute themselves and go ahead and say thank you to Dr. Norman. Thank you, Dr. Norman. Thank, Thank you. you, Dr. Norman. That was a great Thank talk. So Thank you, Dr. Thank Norman. You. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. That was Thank awesome. You. Thank you. I awesome. want to thank the listeners. I really want to thank the listeners because I know it's morning in Hawaii. It's afternoon <laughs> on the East Coast. And I thank them for it. It was really wonderful. We have listeners thank from you. all over the world. So all over. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But I'll Thank keep you. in touch with you, Dr. Norman, and I'll email you. Okay? Thank, Thank you, you, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.